Good evening and welcome to the regular city council meeting of Monday, August 13th, 2018. At this time, can we have the roll call, please? Council Member DeRosset? Here. Council Member Lane? Here. Vice Mayor Klein? Here. Council Member Rhino? Here. And Mayor Vieira? Here. Next, we will have the invocation by Lauren Gregory of the Victory Assembly of God, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight once again just to pray for wisdom and guidance, Father, as we do the people's business. Bless these meetings and let us be of one heart and one mind. We ask these things, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This evening we have one presentation, a presentation of the proclamation declaring August 13th through the 19th, 2018, as National Health Center Week in the city of Ceres, and I think we have, is it Cassie and Anna here? Okay, I do have a proclamation. I'll go ahead and read this to you and then I'll bring it down. Um, the proclamation declaring August 13th to the 19th, 2018 is National Health Center Week, whereas for over 50 years, community health centers have provided high quality, affordable, comprehensive, primary and preventative health care in our nation's underserved communities delivering value to and having a significant impact on America's health care system. Lo locally, Golden Valley Health Centers has been serving our communities since 1972, whereas the county's, excuse me, country's largest primary care network, health centers now serve as the health care home for over 25 million Americans in over 10,000 deliveries delivery sites across the nation. Our local community health center, Golden Valley Health Center, provides critical medical, dental, behavioral health, pharmacy, and specialty services to 150,000 patients throughout Merced and Stanislaus counties. Health centers are locally controlled by patient majority boards, ensuring that the patients of each health center are engaged in their own health care decisions. Whereas, Health centers are locally owned and operated nonprofit businesses that serve as critical economic engines, helping to power local economies by generating billions of dollars in combined economic impact and creating jobs in some of the country's most economically deprived communities. Whereas, whereas health centers continue to prove, excuse me, yeah, provide an effective means of overcoming barriers to health care access including geography, language, income, and insurance status, and in doing so, improves health care outcomes and reduces health care system costs. Whereas National Health Center Week offers the opportunity to recognize America's health centers, their dedicated staff, board members, and all those responsible for their continued success. Whereas during National Health Center Week, we celebrate the legacy of America's health centers and their vital role in shaping the past, present, and future of America's health care system. Now, therefore, I, Chris Fierre, Mayor of the City of Ceres, do hereby proclaim August 13th to the 19th, 2018, as National Health Center Week. I encourage all Americans to take part in this week by visiting their local health centers and celebrate the important partnership between America's health centers and the patients they serve. Proclaim this 13th day of August 2018. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here on behalf of Golden Valley Health Centers and Ceres as we celebrate National Health Center Week. National Health Center Week is an annual celebration with the goal of raising awareness about the mission and accomplishments of America's health centers over the past five decades. Our mission at Golden Valley Health Center is to improve the health of our patients by providing quality, 
<clears throat> primary health services to people in the communities we serve, regardless of language, financial, or cultural barriers. Between our medical, dental, and behavioral health providers, we see an average of 2,400 patients a month here in Ceres. We strive to provide quality care to every citizen we serve. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to a continued partnership with the City of Ceres. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move to citizens communication to council on matters not included on the agenda. While the, while the city council welcomes and encourages participation in city council meetings, adopted rules allow no more than five minutes for expression of non-agenda items. Matters under the jurisdiction of the city council and not on the posted agenda may be addressed by the general public. However, California law prohibits the city council from taking action on any matter which is not on the posted agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the city council. Citizens are entitled to address the city council on any agenda item subject to the five minute provision. This time I do have one speaker card. Um, that's Lee Brandt and I'll call Lee up first. Good evening. My name is Lee Brandt and I live on Haley Aloha. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank all the firefighters that came from all over the world to help California with their fires. As we all know, that it's an awesome, ugly job, but somebody has to do it. Uh, my main thing is I've been, uh, I live on Haley Aloha, which is right off of Central, and I've been trying to walk six days a week down to Smyrna Park. And my route takes me down Haley Aloha to Myrtlewood, and then Myrtlewood to Acorn, and then around Smyrna Park. And I've lived on Haley Aloha for oh, almost three years now. And we have a lot of traffic on that street. And it dawned on me, oh, I don't know, probably about a year ago, that people are using it as a shortcut because it's right in between Hatch and Whitmore. And there's only two stop signs between Central and uh, Mitchell. And there's people that fly down that road. And I mean, especially down Acorn, you know, they hit that and I've been driving for over 50 years and I am a pretty good judge of speed. And they've gotta be doing 35, 40 miles an hour easy. And with schools beginning to open, uh, what, Wednesday or something like that, you know, something's gotta be done. I mean, you know, I, I, I originally, we originally talked about, you know, maybe having a speed bump that's down there, you know, clo on Acorn close to uh, Moffat, you know, something like that. But I know speed bumps are practically impossible because the environmentalists wackos, they won't let us do it or anything like that. But maybe a study could be done on uh, stop signs. If you want to put a stop sign right in front of my house, I don't care. I'm in the middle of the block. It sure would blow everybody away to try to stop there. But something needs to be done. You know, uh, I was walking down the other day and coming down from Carroll Fowler down Garrison towards Moffett, there was a guy that was going from my right to my left. The stop sign right there, yeah, he slowed down, but he was doing about 30 after he slowed down, and he just blew right through the stop sign. You know, and I've kind of got a heightened awareness of people just running stop signs and speeding, you know, because I am out there walking, you know, and I'm sure Dave can probably attribute to it also, you know, with riding a bike. But, you know, I don't know, you know, whatever happened to our you know, the, that little sign truck or whatever it was that, you know, shows the speed limit. I mean, you know, if you want to, you know, give me a radar gun and a, and a, a recliner and I'll sit down and I'll start, you know, I'll start taking, you know, the, the speed limit. But, you know, something's got to be done, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's basically all I want to say. I just want to plant the seed, you know, and uh, good luck. Brent, um, didn't we used to or do we still have speed? Bumps there on the acorn? I thought we did. We do. We do. Yeah, There's one. Down. Further down. Okay. Close to Moffitt. And what would be the what would be the ability to put up uh, the the speed reader? Um, okay. Okay. Maybe we can put his street on the rotation. Okay. Thank you. All right. At this time, is there anyone else that would like to address the council on a non-agenda item? I'm going to add to Lee's uh, comments. I live on Fowler Road. 25 mile an hour speed limit on Fowler Road. If anybody comes down Fowler Road doing 25, 
most of the time they're turning into my driveway to my mobile home park. And a lot of them turn in at about 20, you know, they come around. To, I don't understand. There's the flashing sign that tells them, but it's not on all the time. It needs to be on all the time because that is 25 mile an hour speed limit. And that, oh, people backing out of their driveways and stuff where they start to come out of uh, uh, Las Casitas Mobile Home Park. And if you, if you think that a person's doing 25, it's amazing. To, uh, oh my God, there's one following this law. I, I don't know what, what we can do, but it's, it just, it's insane. And on, on Hatch and Mitchell, 40 miles, they don't even blink at 40. They're gone. They're driving like crazy. I, I would love to have just a, I guess, a traffic trap. But we can't do that anymore, you know. Have the motorcycle guys sitting on a, just behind, where they can just barely be seen and have their gun out, the, the radar gun, and start ticking it the heck out of them. Once you get about 40 of them showing up in court, and don't let them just pay the fine. If you speed on, on one of those major streets, you get to go to the court, and you get to talk to the judge. Maybe that, I don't know, but it's just insane. I used to think that Modesto had lousy drivers. Well, Ceres is catching up. God, some of the people are just, they don't, and usually there's two kinds of speeders. The big SUVs and pickups and the little, I call them LCLPs. Little car loud pipes. They're these little, Honda Civics and stuff, these kids got all the loud pipes and they go down, um, just, it's crazy. <laughs> and I just don't have any, but I would like to see that stop, that light on, on Fowler on all the time. I mean, I've come, gone out somewhere and we come back at nine, 10 o'clock at night. You come that way, it's off. But people don't slow down. So turn it on, leave it on. It's, I know it's got the, the solar thing, so it could probably run at night as well as big time. All day, all night. But that's for Mr. Smith and his fine boys in blue to take care of, but it's just my suggestion. Council Member Rhino. Chief Smith, when do we have the multi-agency saturation coming through again? Because I think they do a lot of good when we have them. They do, and it's on a grant. Um, speaking with Modesto PD, they were talking how they used to have 15 traffic officers, now they have four. Oh. We had four, we now have one. Um, that's part of the issue. But I'll find out and let all of you know when the next time that's coming through here. Thank we you. We will try to do the best we can to work on traffic flow. Thank you. And, you know, school's going to start. Wednesday, so we're going to get a lot more complaints. You know that. Yeah. Okay, anyone else would like to address the council on a non agenda item? Hey, we're a double package here. I'm going to talk regarding the um, <coughs> centennial. My name is Sheila Brandt, I'm over on Haley Aloha. On Saturday, we had our centennial stroll that really turned more into a picnic area at the mansion because it was so hot. A lot of people, once they got to the mansion and did their tour and kind of sat around and listened to the music and had things to eat, um, really didn't make it through the downtown area like we had hoped. Um, because the, it was just so hot. But I want to thank those people who were able to make it out there on Saturday. It was just a fun event. Um, I do understand we had people telling us that um, kind of a 
bummer is that um, downtown looked pretty bad. There was a lot of trash on the ground prior to our centennial walk. I would have thought that maybe that would have gotten cleaned up some, um, knowing that we were going to have a lot of people coming in that we were hoping they were going to do the walk, but they really didn't do it. But it was really a fun event. And since we're both on Centennial and both on the Water Tower, I thought I'd give you an update on the Water Tower. Um, we had a celebrity dinner, as most of you know. I wanted to thank Mr. DeRossett for coming out and waiting tables for us. And we had some people out in our audience. We had Mr. Parson, Mr. Brandt, Ms. Wilson, uh, Mr. Romo, Mr. Smith. So we had quite a few celebrities. And um, we haven't really raised a lot of money this past year for the Water Tower because our focus has been on the Centennial. That's kind of taken up a lot of our time and a lot of our, um, our, a lot of our energy. energy. <laughs> yeah. But um, as soon as the centennial is over, we wanted to give you an update that next year uh, we really want to focus on the water tower. And everything that we've done this year has given us the opportunity to publicize that it's coming and publicize what we're doing. We've gotten a lot of the word out. I get stopped a lot. Hey, are you guys working on the water tower? And so it is coming. But we wanted to give you an update that it was a success, successful fundraiser. We raised a couple, well, almost. Well, about $1,600, $1,800. Um, I have some cash and some checks to give to Miss Dean here pretty soon. And we are selling t-shirts to keep raising money, but the more we get the word out, I think the more we actually start to do the, the hardcore fundraising, uh, more people are gonna know about it. So um, Miss Rhino, Mr. Klein, Mr. Lane um, gave us their support. Unfortunately, they couldn't wait tables that day, but we appreciated the support and the cheering on that you gave to us. So thank you for your help. Thank you very much. Anyone else? G. Akeley Series. Uh, recently they had a <coughs> citizenship oath in the auditorium over there. I guess that's the auditorium. Mr. Bear was there and a few other people. Chief Police was there. Uh, there seems to be a problem it's, it, it is really minute compared to all these other complaints, but that's what it's all about, complaining. The chairs that are used in this building, some of them are really disgusting, and evidently they've been tried to clean before several times. They must be, what, 10, 11, 12 years old now? Is there something we can do? It just, they look terrible. I mean, you got people that use these all the time. Uh, evidently, they, they uh, whenever they got this whole thing going with the building and everything. They got these chairs and stuff. They weren't thinking of material-wise and longevity. But there, you see some of them, they're not like the chairs you guys got. You can wipe them down with something and clean them up. You can't do that with these, and they look really bad. Something has to be done with that. Okay. Do we have a capital improvement program or replacement for those? Those wouldn't be capital. No, those are just office equipment. Okay. That's the first I've heard of that complaint, but we'll yeah, look into it. Yeah, that is as well. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. With that, we will move on. Uh, appointments to boards and commissions. We have one this evening. Um, the Stan Cog appointment, Mr. Wells. As the council is aware, uh, generally on an annual basis as part of the beginning of the year, the appointment to the different various boards and committees are completed. Uh, in this particular case, the Stan Cog uh, board uh, member uh, was requested by Mayor Vieira to, to be changed, um, and that is the recommendation of Mayor Vieira, but it requires per our, our codes for it to be ratified by the council. For that ch change in appointment, that's the only item that would be reflected on that uh, appointment schedule. Uh, the next uh, look at that would occur uh, in January after the election. So that it just takes okay. council ratification of uh, the change in the appointment at Stancock. Okay, are there any questions? The, one of the reasons that um, I had requested to um, put myself back on COG is, as many of you know, um, we are in line to get the ACE platform station for, um, for the ACE train. And um, Senator Canella, former mayor of ours, was uh, instrumental in, in helping make that happen. And so um, I just had some discussions with him and I said I wanted to help bring his, uh, his vision to fruition. And so I um, wanted to um, just 
put myself back on COG so that I could try to make that a priority of mine to to deliver before, um, you know, it, it, hopefully um, before the, the the 2023 date, um, if all things go well, um, we could be seeing a train as early as 2020 with actual work beginning um, next year on, um, there's really two phases of what would be done. The first would be lighting and safety improvements that you'll see around uh, the park and the downtown area, followed by, um, uh, if again, all things go well, late next year, early the uh, following year, uh, the platform and the connection being made. Mm -hmm. So um, so I'm, I'm excited about that, and, and, and that's what the request is here. So I don't know if anybody had any other questions, or do you need a motion or what? I'll make a motion to have the uh, mayor put back on Stancog. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member DeRosset? Yes. Council Member Lane? Yes. Vice Mayor Klein? Yes. Council Member Rhino? Yes. And Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. And I, before we move on, I did want to thank um, uh, Vice Mayor Klein for the time that he did uh, serve on there. He did an excellent job and. Um, and if it weren't for this, then I would have still had him there. But um, again, th thank you for your time. A conflict of interest declaration. Is there anyone on the council that would like to declare a conflict of interest on any of the consent calendar items or one discussion item? Okay, hearing none, we will move to the consent calendar. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be enacted by a single motion unless otherwise requested by an individual council member or the public for special consideration. Otherwise, recommendation of staff will be accepted and acted upon by roll call vote. At this time, is there anyone on the council that would like a consent calendar item pulled for further discussion? Item 11. Okay. All right, is there anyone in the audience that would like a consent calendar item pulled other than item 11? Okay, hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council for direction on the other items. Move to approve one, two, three, four, five, A, B, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Councilmember DeRosset? Yes. Councilmember Lane? Yes. Vice Mayor Klein? Yes. Councilmember Rhino? Yes. And Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes five zero. Okay, item number 11, resolution number 2018-085, declaring the redemption fund as surplus, ordering the disposition of surplus amounts, and approving the district closeout analysis and findings report prepared by NBS for West Point Refunding Reassessment District. Council Member Rhino. I would like to discuss what we anticipate doing with the surplus money of seven hundred and fourteen thousand dollars i understand um, trying to give it back to all the property owners would be probably almost impossible given the change in ownership and everything and i can i see where legally we can use the remaining surplus for maintenance issues or replacement in the assessment district. But if you look at page three, and there, there's a list of five different projects that could be done in the West Point district. And the first one is the roundabout project at Morgan Road, but I thought that was being funded by SB1. Is it being funded by SB1? Partially funded by SB1, partially funded by CMAC. These funds will be supplemental to make sure that project is fully funded. Okay. And then there's the Aristocrat Drive intersection that will replace the existing three-way stop, upgrades of the existing median landscaping on Malik and Aristocrat, improvements to the play area in Strawberry Park, and repair the tree-damaged sidewalk, curb, and gutter. What I would like to see is, um, I think the residents that live there should really receive more of a benefit than spending that money on the roundabout project. I would like to see the first thing be done would be 
the existing median landscaping on Malik and Aristocrat. As you all know, I've sat up here a couple different times complaining about how horrible those medians are. And it seems to me that this would be the perfect time and a perfect way to spend some of their money to make that very attractive. Maybe put in um, drought tolerant or something and put weed barrier down so we don't have the problem with all the weeds. I mean, there's so many plants that are missing and some of those medians have so many weeds in them. It's really, it's really disgusting. It really is. I would like to see that at the top of the list. The next thing I'd like to see would be improvements to the play area in Strawberry Park. I mean, that's their neighborhood park. They've paid for it. It needs to be maintained and it needs to be updated. I think it could use more play equipment for the children in the neighborhood. I think it would be nice to have a cement walkway around the park like we've done um, at Sam Rhino Park. I mean, it, it, because you actually see, see people in the neighborhood walking around and, and utilizing it. I think they could also have a covered area with a barbecue. And the bathrooms, they're one of the neighborhood parks, if only the only one that has bathrooms, but they need some maintenance too. I mean, the toilets, of course, have been, the toilet seats are ripped off, but the hinges are still there. The um, sinks are, like there's a continuous dripping of water, so they obviously need some maintenance. So I think that should come before the roundabout project. And the tree damaged sidewalks, curbs and gutters, that needs, that would be my number three. And then if there's any money left and we can't think of anything else that can really affect the neighborhood that the people can really um, enjoy, then if there is some money left, then maybe we do help out with the roundabout project. But I really think the money you know, they've, they were the ones who have paid for that, and I really think they should see the benefit of it. Okay. These items weren't listed in any particular order. Um, the discussion or the description of the landscape improvements, you described exactly what uh, staff's idea was to increase the aesthetic value of it as well as reducing the maintenance cost <clears throat> so that those mediums look aesthetically pleasing and also are easier to maintain. So that is the primary goal. Um, and again, they're not listed in any particular order. Um, we feel that the estimates that we've put together are sufficient to accomplish all of those goals uh, that are listed here. Uh, but if we'd like to list them, again, the report was put together from by MBS, the result of input from staff um, with estimates for each one of these items and a contingency built into each one of those, um, we do feel that we can accomplish the goals that are listed. Um, in terms of timing, we haven't got to that level. We have to do this step first before we can identify the capital improvement projects, but that list of priorities would be consistent with staff's list as well. The only difference would be that roundabout project is you know, slated and anticipated to start construction since it's already been awarded. Okay, well, since it was a consent item and they were listed in this order, I just wanted to be sure and state what I would like to see for that subdivision. Again, the residents or the property owners, they've paid for that and they should be seeing something for the money that they've spent. So which one was your number one? My, my number one would be the median. the median landscaping. I mean, <laughs> I think one time I even brought pictures for you, you for the rest of the council to and see. And then two improvements to the play area in Strawberry Park? That's number two. Two would be the improvements to the play area. Three would be the, the tree, tree sidewalk, curb and gutter. And then if there still is money, because I looked in here and I didn't see what the projected amount was for each project, but then it then it could go for the roundabout project but again i really feel the people that live there deserve to have things that they can enjoy they, they've spent the money does anyone on the council have an issue with that priority no 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 okay. i think she, i think she should um council member rhino if you're going to make a motion on that you would you would include that as a priority as your list okay 
Okay, before we do that, uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this? Um, actually, I'd like to mirror basically a lot of what she said. Uh, the only thing that I would say that I would have, con not really concerned with, but on the repair, the tree damage sidewalk, um, I believe there's already probably money set aside under public for streets to do that. I would think that would be a budgeted item. No, that. there's no funds set, set aside for that. Okay. Um, Cause that's obviously a safety issue. Uh, as far as the roundabout part goes, um, as council member Rhino stated, you know, over there we've paid the money and you know, you're paying it for your, your landscape and the lighting and a roundabout doesn't really cover that. It's not in the actual neighborhood. The park is utilized. There are people there at six o'clock in the morning, exercising, walking around it. They walk their dogs, the elderly, the small children, uh, have an access to a bathroom for especially the elderly and the little kids that are playing in the playground would be nice because I've seen it where before they've been locked and uh, you know little boys do what little boys do on the side of the building so but I, I personally would like to see the upgrades to the uh, the medians as a priority because they are just barren or if they're not barren and just dirt there's nothing but weeds so that would be the priority of myself and a couple of my neighbors that I spoke with prior to coming this evening. Thank you. Is there anyone else would like to speak on this item? Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. Move to adopt resolution number 2018-085 with a priority list for the use of surplus money. Number one being the upgrades of the existing median landscaping on Malik Boulevard and Aristocrat Drive. Number two, improvements to the play area in Strawberry Park. Number three, repair tree, damage sidewalk, curb and gutter. And if there's any money left to help with the roundabout project at Morgan Road. All second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member DeRosset. Yes. Council Member Lane. Yes. Vice Mayor Klein. Yes. Council Member Rhino. Yes. And Mayor Vieira. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Okay, we have no unfinished business this evening. Um, no public hearing, no new business. We have one discussion item, mobile food vendors. Mr. Wells. Thank you, Mayor Vieira. This is a follow-up item that we initiated the conversation on uh, mobile food vendors back in March. Um, unfortunately, a budget and a few other things have uh, taken higher priority, so we are revisiting this idea. Staff has uh, come up with a, a concept here based on council direction. We want to bring it back to you to make sure we get some feedback, to make sure we're headed in the right direction. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Westbrook, who will give you an overview of the framework that's been put together. It's in your packet for consideration this evening. Thank you, Toby, uh, Mayor Council. Um, just to let you know where we started. So as you know, um, uh, Ceres hasn't allowed mobile food vendors for a very long time. So countywide, I just did a little comparison. Uh, Ceres, Houston, Riverbank don't allow mobile food vendors. Modesto, um, they're allowed by right. There is no approval process for the city of Modesto. Newman, Oakdale, and Patterson all require mobile food vendors to get a conditional <laughs> use permit issued by their city's planning commission for mobile food vendors. And Stanislaus County, Turlock, and Waterford all allow those to be approved administratively at a staff level by a various person, um, some being a police chief, uh, administrative service director, et cetera. <clears throat> So based upon the, the meeting and the direction that was provided earlier this year, staff's kind of come up with an approach um, to, to possibly create some allowances for mobile food vendors, um, certainly not going as far as allowing them by right like the city of Modesto has, uh, but allowing some to be phased in kind of in kind of a test period. And so what we've established are some um, standards and performance measures for mobile food vehicles. And we've really kind of allowed a three-tiered process. Um, some of those are speed to market um, versus the time frame that they're permitted. So one of the things that we had considered through our existing processes that we already have in place, um, one being approval of a temporary use permit. So a temporary use permit is something that can be issued for a special event um, and perhaps um, and not to exceed 15 days per year. 
um, a good example of something like that maybe happening for um, a temporary use permit maybe be river oaks golf course decides to hold an event um, uh, they've done one before on their range they had some music uh, perhaps temporary use permit could be issued for them so that they could have some mobile food vehicles during that event so that's something that would happen on a very infrequent basis again temporary use permit would only allow 15 events uh, up to 15 events per year the second thing we, we we said is there's maybe some businesses in town that um, maybe don't have the ability to have a kitchen facility uh, but maybe food would be a good uh, complement to their existing business and so um, the second level of that would be an administrative use permit process administrative use permit can be allowed up to 180 days per year so certainly well beyond 15 but doesn't allow it for 12 months a year the administrative permit and the temporary use permit could be approved by me at staff level so the process by which they get those um, requests in uh, is pretty streamlined with the temporary use permit and the administrative generally probably taking 10 to maybe 15 business days to get approved we would route it around to various departments to make sure that um, <clears throat> that uh, there's no issue for police fire etc the kind of the last level and the most stringent measure uh, would also provide the most flexibility uh, in terms of the duration of a mobile food vehicle so the last level would be a conditional use permit if somebody applied for a conditional use permit then they would be allowed to um, operate their uh, mobile food vehicle for a year uh, basically a 12-month period uh, with all of these uh, processes because this is something that we're kind of wading into um, after decades of not allowing them we want to have some uh, pretty stringent standards so for each of them these would need to be renewed annually so if somebody says well I have a conditional use permit for a certain location um, every year they'd have to reapply for a conditional use permit the benefit of allowing that uh, process kind of on an annual basis if there's issues then they can be addressed either through um, supplemental conditions of approval or uh, termination of the the mobile food vendor altogether so we've kind of taken that three-step approach so it doesn't you know limit any one person if somebody's looking to just have a single event maybe want to have food trucks the temporary use permit would be their option if somebody wanted to have it just maybe a couple of days a week at their location the administrative use permit could be a good option for them and then if there's somebody that wanted to have it year-round then they could have uh, go through the conditional use permit process some of the standards that we've included in here um, talk about owner notification business uh, notification so that folks that are looking to, to place a mobile food vehicle there's a little bit of outreach so that there um, uh, if there's any bricks and sticks that maybe serve food that they're made aware that there's somebody going in a location near them um, a couple of the things that were important to us to include um, that we thought the council may agree with is if there is somebody that's going to be there for more than four or five hours in a day that they have to have access to uh, laboratory facilities so that they can wash their hands doesn't necessarily have to be for customers it has to be for the folks that are working inside the mobile food vehicle and it has to be within 200 feet so you have to be in uh, close proximity to a building the other thing that was important to us to include from an aesthetic standpoint so I'm sure you've seen on TV or you've been around in communities you've seen a food truck very nice at a location um, some other places there may be tables and chairs set up at the exterior and people kind of eat like it's a restaurant outside of that uh, staff felt it was important to not allow the tables and chairs and easy ups <coughs> excuse me on the exterior of a mobile food vehicle so that um, you know our mobile food vehicles if this uh, would proceed forward would just be the vehicle itself so if somebody came up they would order their food they would take it to go it wouldn't be opportunities for them to sit um, now an example or an exception to that is if somebody had a location uh, where there was tables and chairs near a park or a plaza or something like that then perhaps people could just um, uh, eat right near the mobile food vehicle but generally there wouldn't be any tables or chairs set up at the exterior of the vehicle it would just be the vehicle they would be there for their sales hour and then they would go home um, in the evening they wouldn't be there um, all along the other thing that we wanted to make sure that uh, we included was kind of some visibility of uh, the permit requirements so we don't want folks coming in from other jurisdictions just setting up on uh, parcels and and having their mobile food uh, vending operations and so we want to make sure whether it's a sticker or a magnet somebody that through the approval process not so much the temporary use permit because those will be generally a one-day deal 
um, but making sure that uh, it's really easily notified that uh, this vehicle is permitted to operate in series. And also um, to keep it the, the kind of the numbers low and that we don't jump around to various locations, approval process for an administrative permit and a conditional use will be good for one vehicle at one location. So I can't necessarily take my mobile food vehicle and go anywhere within the city. I would have to get approvals at multiple locations to do that. So kind of limiting the numbers. The other thing that we had uh, suggested is not having another mobile food vehicle within a thousand feet of another one. So you wouldn't have necessarily concentrations of the mobile food vehicles within the city. So that's kind of in summary, so certainly here to answer any questions you may have, uh, but we just wanted to kind of take a shot at maybe providing some framework uh, for possible allowances of mobile food vehicles within the city, um, noting that we haven't had them for decades and kind of um, cracking the door to see if there, there are certain things that we want to consider um, for allowances for our business community and our, and our residents. Okay. This time, is there anyone on the council that has any questions or comments of staff? Uh, council Member Lane? Yeah, <clears throat> you mentioned a thousand feet. so. That would be on the conditional use permit, I would assume, because you could have an event where you have a couple, right? Of the Generally, it would be, if you had the temporary use permit, certainly that doesn't apply, but for the administrative permit and the conditional use permit, the thousand, thousand, thousand foot would apply. Okay. Because if you had an event, you might have five or six vehicles right. in one location at, at one time. Generally, that's only going to be a for a day. Right, okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Klein? On a temporary use permit, how, was, how would the city monitor the 15 days? The permit is issued by us, and so if somebody's coming in and they want multiple days, they have to put on their application the days and the times that they're going to be um, exercising that, that right. So um, it's very infrequent. Generally, a temporary use permit is issued for uh, one day. However, there are circumstances where some of our um, Nonprofit clubs have gotten flower sales, so they have multiple flower sales, maybe right around Valentine's Day and then again in Mother's Day, but they put those on the application so we know exactly where they're going to be and when. And on a um, AUP, and I'm, it's off the top of my head, um, when you say no more than 180 days and you were talking about um, admin administrative use permits, uh, that you want to put a little sticker on it so they are allowed to be at basically one location or that. But let's say those people decide to do uh, an event at River Oaks and that same vendor with the same food truck for the following weekend is booked for Blake, Blaker Brewing. Would they have to pull an additional administrative use permit? So the administrative use permit, um, you bring up Blaker Brewing as an example. Um, they're ones that we could envision having something like this, maybe having a, a vendor for a couple nights a week. Uh, in that circumstance, I think that specifically, if you had an administrative use permit, they would have one for a permanent location. If that same vendor was looking to do another event in town, they would have to apply for the temporary use permit somewhere else. They wouldn't necessarily get an, a second um, administrative use permit unless they were looking to do a couple days a week at one location and a couple days a week at another. If they okay. were looking to do that and they were going to exceed the 15 day uh, limit, then they would need two uh, administrative use permits for okay. two different locations. Councilman Rhino? On the temporary use permit, they have 15 days that they can have throughout the year, correct? Correct. So who on staff do we have that's going to be able to enforce that they're really only out there 15 days? The staff would just have to enforce that. Typically a temporary use permit, they're specified certain days, it's gonna be pretty easy to track that. So and it's, it, really, it, it's really gonna be if somebody calls and complains and says, they're out there they seem like they're out there too much uh, we're hopeful that that won't be the case with the temporary use permit we're, we're thinking it's going to be maybe a larger scale event that's one day a week um, certainly if somebody exceeds that requirement then they're certainly going to shoot themselves in the foot so to speak because they won't be issued one again if they don't follow the rules on the administrative use permit 180 days or six months so someone could set up a food truck at Home Depot 
It doesn't have to be a restaurant type of business. They could set up a, a, this, this a would food truck at. This would allow provisions for that. Um, the only limitation would just be the number of days. So if a vendor said, well, I want to be there Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays every week, they would fall below that 180 day requirement. Okay. Then they could also set up tables. No, no tables. Do you remember many years ago there was a food wasn't there a food vendor at Home Depot and they kind of they kind of were stuck up against the building? The building. Yes, I do recall that maybe right right after they first opened. Yes. And they, I believe they had like a table, but they're absolutely not going to be able to have a table. We're suggesting in at least the provisions that we've established that we don't want tables. If folks are going to go to the mobile food vehicle, they're going to pick up their food and they're going to go on their way. So somebody could set up a mobile food vendor at close to the front of the building, correct? Yes. And then they could have another one out in the parking lot somewhere? No, because it has to be a thousand feet away. Well, I don't know how far a thousand feet. Is. It's 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 more than that property. The property okay. uh, Home Depot is probably a thousand feet across. Maybe it's frontage of Hatch Road, so it wouldn't be possible to have two on that same property. Okay. But you could have one maybe at Kmart near Hatch and Herndon. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Drossett. Yeah, how uh, how are we going to collect fees for this? Doing that? Through the administrative use permit process, temporary use permit and conditional use permit. So um, the temporary use permit process, I want to say off the top of my head, I think that fee is around $250. The administrative permit, I think, is around 400 Conditional use permit is around 1000 um, For the administrative permit process and the uh, conditional use permit, those folks will also be required to have business license. So the processing fees will be collected up front before a permit is issued. And those are just under existing fee structures. The, the reason I'm saying this is because it's almost like the, a person, as you stated, would pay $1,000 for the entire year being at some location, and then there's no, there's no tax dollars that are being generated from that. The business license. <clears throat> the business license, we would be, they would be paying on the basis of their sales. Mills tax. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. That's all. Okay. I got it. <clears throat> so we... we cover our administrative costs through the right. use permit process and then the requirement that you're not going to issue a use permit unless you have a business license then allows us to collect on that side of their their sales okay councilmember lane uh, just one question i mean you know i'm glad i think all these things you're putting in place are really good i think it could be a good program for for those that want to do that and use it whether it's a business like um blaker or possibly even rusty nail downtown um, some of those places that could use it, you know, for a for a administrative. The concern I have is, um, it's two hundred and fifty dollars. Is that for a conditional use permit for the day, uh, or two hundred and fifty would be the temporary use permit? So that's the limit of uh, the fifteen temporary days. Temporary for the day, or uh, temporary days. could be one day. It could be up to fifteen days per calendar year. So, okay. for example, if the golf course the golf course said, well, we want to hold you know, five events at our golf course with food trucks in a year, they could pay once, the $250 once, they would just note each of the dates, and then they're, they're, they're good. The administrative use permit, I think, is around $400. Um, that's the limit to 180 days, and then the conditional use permit is the most expensive. Okay. Because the conditional use permit is going to require planning commission approval. Okay, I guess, I guess that's good. Um, but, you know, you see these little guys going around town with their little food wagons and you know that are breaking the laws all the time i'm concerned with the fact unless we have something in place and i think we need to have something in place and maybe it is maybe i'm just not seeing it for those who decide you know what hey Sirius is doing food business down food trucks now i'm just going to set up over here right and so i would like to see something in this maybe it is right i haven't talked about it i haven't looked all the way through it sorry um but I would like to see something in, you know, the first warning, right? You get one warning, right? And that's it. After that, you know, it's $250. It's $500 fine, mm -hmm. right? I mean, just double whatever it is. These are the parameters for issuing permits. So recognize this doesn't exist today. 
We do not no, have a provision okay. to allow this today. That's what we're right. asking for direction on how we're going to allow this. Okay. What you're asking for is an enforcement activity that would be secondary to, to this. this action. Yeah. Yeah, right. So there's kind of two pieces of that puzzle. So one of the overall frameworks that we're asking for is how would you like to go about, if you're interested in proceeding, we, we want to know uh, would you like to do a pilot program you know, where we do this for six months? Also recognize we're in the process of doing a comprehensive municipal code up update where we could incorporate both this framework as well as a fine or penalty structure. Those things could be built in as well. So, I mean, our, our check-in today was primarily looking for are we on the right path and are these provisions in place? And the second part of that follow-up is how do we want to move forward? So right. two steps and, in that process. And I'm okay with what you've got written, but... I'm not okay if we don't have an enforcement part to go with this. And, and I think that one of the last things that I mentioned in my remarks, Ian, talking about that kind of permit and whether it's a sticker or a magnet or something that's an easy identifier, because then you can find anybody that's out there looking um, for potential violators could see fairly easily that this is one that is permitted. So if you found one that didn't have the sticker or the magnet, then you know they're not permitted. It's a pretty easy um, enforcement thing. Right. And, you know, I'd let you guys figure all that out. But again, I think it should be substantial um, going to the enforcement side. And I'm, you know, understand what you're doing here and I'm OK with it. Mm -hmm. I think you guys are going the right direction as far as I'm concerned. But but I still think to do this, that enforcement piece has to be in place with this. Yes, it's very important. So, so, so. Um, because you don't want to penalize the folks that went through the process no. correctly. No. And you just want to make sure that you know, when, when it is enforced, it gets their attention too, so. Councilmember Member Rhino. Back to Home Depot. So, <laughs> so we, we know, I don't know what 1,000 feet looks like. What does 200 feet look like from the, um, from the front of the store to the, to Hatch Road? You're probably there. Are we going to be out in Hatch Road? No, no, no. Oh, no, no. okay. No, no, no. You you would be in the parking lot somewhere. Okay. Um, so so they could set up a food truck, a mobile vendor, out in the parking lot, and then and then Kmart could get approval, someone to set up out in the parking lot in front of Kmart, correct? Assumably that they're more than a thousand feet away. Yes. Well on the other side but so you could and then you could move down this direction and another thousand feet and so we could be driving down hatch road and we could be seeing a mobile mobile food vendor here another one here and another one here because they're not necessarily going to be more inconspicuous by being up against the building you are correct. Um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is there may be some property owners or shopping centers who say, I'm not interested in having a mobile food vendor on my property. Well, that's true, but what if they all go, woo, it's going to bring people in, and I don't want to be driving down Hatch Road or down Mitchell Road, and I, now I'm going to see basically a lineup of mobile food vendors. And I know we have um, on number eight that sanitary facilities have to be within 200 feet of the vehicle's location correct so they could just get right at 200 feet but then when you look at the trash enclosures it doesn't say anything about them having to have garbage receptacles like right I, may, at I may have missed it but i believe that we included that that they had to provide uh, trash receptacles for their uh, well, for their customers. I see number 23 that says they have a written agreement with property owners to allow for the use of their existing trash, trash receptacles. So you know as well as I that if your mobile food vendors out here and your garbage is up there, they're not going to go and use it. And, and just to kind of touch back on the thousand feet, that's just a number that staff threw out if it needs to be 1,500 or 2,000 feet. I mean, this program doesn't exist, and so we're just allowing some allowances, but if it needs to be a greater distance, staff is not opposed to that at all. And then I have my kind of maybe my last question. Location on particular roadways, so they can just park on a street, not, is that correct? No, they need to be on private property. Well, what is 18 then, location on particular roadways?
It says it applies to AUP and CUP, and TUP could potentially allow for bending within said roadways. The, if I re recall correctly, it was idea about somebody being on a corner. Um, so like, say for example, the corner of Roading and Mitchell. If they wanted to place their um, mobile food vendor on that corner that may block the visibility of either corner, then that would be a location that we wouldn't want to allow, if I remember correctly. Like a, like a site visibility site issue. Site visibility, corner visibility, those type of things. So constraining, having basically another provision in there to make sure that we're not creating any problems with where they're located on the site gives us another tool of, of limiting that. But I do okay. think well, you're correct. Well, the way I read it, it looks like they could put it on yeah. the road. I think you're correct. We, we, could use a, we, we could That's use easy. a little cleanup there. I think the intent was is that we didn't want to prohibit somebody from maybe utilizing downtown 4th Street to have a festival that had food trucks. I think that's okay, but on a permanent basis with the, with the conditional use permit or the administrative, we wouldn't want to see them on the roadway. We'd want to see them on private property, so we can clean that up. Because the way I read it, you can be parked on Fowler Road right there next to Smyrna Park underneath the not underneath but in front of the awning and they can turn around and eat everything the, the, eat the right. zoning the zoning restrictions in here wouldn't allow that okay so they, they need to be on a commercial or industrial zoned uh, parcel but certainly we see the errors of our way we can clean that up a bit because we don't want them to be on the roadways well and I don't think we want the industrial zone property all of a sudden to have a lineup of food vendors either yeah, and vendors. I think that that's where if we want to increase that provision of distance between them, we have no issue with that whatsoever. I mean, it makes it easier for me, so. I, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of like, and I think we talked about this before, to maybe only be in the industrial area at this time and to have just a small few and, and have it be a trial. I mean, I'm just seeing, and again, I, not to dive into <clears> this and it doesn't necessarily say, but like in Modesto, they can only be in certain areas. I mean, they're, they're not like downtown uh, or where McHenry Village is, even though our way it's written, I believe, says if we had a McHenry Village, there could be a taco truck there if somebody wanted to try to go after a, a, a conditional use permit. Actually, Modesto doesn't have any restrictions. Yeah, I believe Modesto right. allows them by right. There may be zoning areas that they don't allow them, but but there there is no approval right. process but, for you know, them. Well, and like I think well, there is because the cupcake lady was having problems in Modesto about where she could locate. But then if we limit it to an industrial zone, let's say River Oaks wants to put a function on, they're not industrial zoned. It's a function, so that's, that's 15. But, per, but, per but you're, taking, you're taking into concept that we're limiting it to industrial zones, so if you do that, then basically River Oaks would not be allowed to have, to have a function. Well, I'm saying that there could be a clause that with that temporary use permit for the 15 days, maybe places like that could have it. I'm just seeing that we're going to have a food truck, at, and I, I don't want it. And save Mart. And, you're trying to lim you're saying and, limit for the for AUP less. or the TUP, yes. or the AUP or CUP, but not a limitation on the TUP. Okay, yeah. that's I that's mean, why I, we're I talking. I want to be known for the you know food truck capital right. world. I, I and I, I think it's it is a trial period, right? We could go up well, to a year. We don't have. I mean, we don't have anything today. Right. This is this is a concept that we're looking for direction on how you'd like to move forward. We don't have to do anything. We can do a trial. We can implement this as part of our municipal code update. We can refine this and bring it back. I mean, this is really our check-in with a parameters and some basically what we've taken as best practices for other jurisdictions that we've seen. Put that all together and, you know, like Tom mentioned, we had kind of a variety across the county. So what we took was kind of what we felt were kind of the better options based on last feedback and try to fit those in a framework. And we're looking for your feedback and kind of direction and take that and mold it into something that works for the council. And if, if it doesn't work, you know, no, no problem. But we wanted to right. see if we can get there and move that forward. So there's, there's lots of levels here. That's why we kind of brought that kind of three-step process, right? TUP is the easiest, but more, more limited. AUP a little more um, broad reaching and the CUP obviously being the most uh, comprehensive. Councilman Moreno. I think since we have prohibited, prohibited them for so many years, I'd like to maybe ease into it, and I would really be most comfortable if we had it for special events. You know, like everyone's talked about River Oaks, if they wanted to have some kind of a food truck extravaganza or something, or they're gonna have 
night golf and they want to bring in you know a, a, a food truck but I would like to try it on more of a limited basis just to see how it goes okay I mean I, I my comments I, I think we should um, have a trial period I think that's what probably would be good and then we could expand it beyond um, whether it's six months or, or what have you I think we can get around the location wise if we just pulled out a map and said okay we want the industrial areas we want river oaks and anywhere else it doesn't have to be a st stagnant document it could be something that we we reevaluate in six months and say have we got all the areas that we think that we'd want to to do so I think there's ways around that and the one question I would have is I'm assuming all of these food trucks still have to be licensed or permitted by Stanislaus County Department of Health absolutely which for someone who's gone through that process, and I won't use the word, you know, Gestapo, but it's not an easy process, and you have to make sure that you can wash your hands and clean, and, and for those of you who remember that I had um, the copy machine, I, I had not gotten it. Um, uh, I was in the process of them certifying it when I ended up selling it, but it was not an easy process. Um, so... Uh, there, there are there's some pretty stringent requirements that you have to go through. So, um, if I, if I could, Mayor, I think that uh, you know Councilman Rhino is suggesting maybe pulling back the reins a bit. Um, would it be possible maybe considering uh, whether it be an industrial zone or a zone specific? Okay the temporary use permits kind of going where um, they can within the community but maybe looking at the administrative use permit as something that could be allowed in the industrial initially but then not really offering anything related to a conditional use permit yet well i think before we decided that we'd want it to go into industrial i would certainly hope we would talk to the businesses out there because they may not want food trucks lined up on their road that would be my concern. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I hope that we'll clarify the language that it would have to be on a property and not on the roadway itself. Well, Mr. Westbrook, I, 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 I sort of lean, lean a little bit your way. Temporary use permit, you know, uh, with the way it is, I think we can live with, I can live with that. The uh, administrative use permit, I think if we come up with some kind of thing for an industrial area where it is on private property, uh, you know, and, and I agree with uh, Mayor Vieira that maybe we need to do this on a trial basis to see how many people actually come in and ask for permits, see where we want. Maybe we'll want to turn around and, and limit it to, you know, no more than food, eight, eight food trucks, food vendors in the city of Ceres. And sort of you know designate certain areas so you know I think the conditional use permit we should just table for a while to see how this other thing goes and not allow a conditional use permit on a full-time basis and one thing that I wanted to, to just make sure though I, I know that at Blaker they're they're using the food trucks and it's providing a success for them and I think that the city is pleased with what's happening out there I want to make sure that Nothing that we're doing here is going to interrupt that. They're the example of what really when we set out with this conversation is we, we want to be able to find things that help our existing businesses and those folks who've invested in our community help them to be more successful. The last thing that we want to do, and I said this before, is take away from those businesses that have invested in our community. So, you know, we see these opportunities as trying to craft it so that we give those businesses opportunity for success and growth and not competition are taking away so that's kind of the framework that we were going after is you know you mentioned rusty nail and other uh, you know businesses that may have limitations and not have a full kitchen but a partnership with a mobile food vendor can help their business grow and that's the kind of activity you know Blaker is one of these examples that we're seeing success and the community seeing success we want to find a way to ensure that we're encouraging that activity at this time, what I want to do is I want to open up to the public and see if I, if anyone has any comments, um, and then I can bring it back to the council for more discussion and direction. So at this time, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item? If so, please come forward and state your name.
Hello, everybody. I'm Juan Romo. I'm president of the Series Chamber of Commerce. And uh, as far as uh, what Tom's been saying, what you guys have been saying, I, I agree. Uh, the chamber agrees that we do need to see some kind of uh, 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 food truck or the food truck done correctly. Blaker Brewing is the best way to, to, to use that as an example. They're doing it great. It's helping them. Obviously, we want to we want to diversify a little bit in series. We want to make sure that uh, that the businesses like Rusty Nail, um, if they if they have an event, they could bring in a food truck uh, done correctly and obviously with the right permits, with the right limitations. Um, I think that that uh, food trucks would really help out um, events uh, like uh, street fair. Obviously not, I'm sorry, not the street fair, because we have other stuff going on, but other festivals, other things that might be coming uh, in the future, we could, we could implement something that, that'll work to help uh, bring in more people, more revenue, obviously more tax dollars for, for the city. So I think uh, it's a positive thing uh, done correctly. That's okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this? I'm going to go over to Home Depot. Uh, what <laughs> I, I, I sit back there thinking, you know, if they had set up at Home Depot, what's to, what's to prevent Home Depot from setting up tables? I mean, I know the food vendor can't, but you know what I'm saying? Like if they go out to River Oaks, they set up. Is River Oaks going to be able to set up tables? It's like, ugh. That'll be a special event, so there'll be um, certain allowances for uh, the temporary use permits that yeah. would not be the same for another commercial business. Yeah, I was just thinking of Home Depot, and you know, like they have the truck here, and then they're going to set up their tables over there. You know. Yeah, that I think that vendor was successful um, um, years ago in front of Home Depot before Kmart, or not Kmart, but before Burger King showed up. So if oh, somebody's yeah. hungry that goes to Home Depot, they can get a Whopper at Burger King. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dave Pratt series. Yeah, I was I was going to bring up that um, Blaker Brewery and as an example because some businesses uh, don't want to put a kitchen in and would like to have food now and then. Then in in, in a temporary um, truck uh, wouldn't hurt. Uh, when I worked at Warehouser, um, it was too hard finding food, finding food. So uh, they had a taco truck show up at, at uh, breaks and lunch times for us. Uh, so we had at least a hot meal, hot meal. And, but, you know, like you said, you talk about Home Depot and stuff, you got all the food uh, courts there now. Like you said, Burger King and IHOP and all those. those so uh, they're most likely not going to have one for too long. Thank you. No one else? Hi, I'm Nelson Ramirez. I'm the owner of the Rusty Nail. Um, I'd just like to say a couple comments. I, what Mr. Westbrook has brought up about the food trucks and having uh, like a three-step process. I think those are all good ideas. Um, Councilman Rhino's uh, talking about limiting. I think it's also a good idea. Maybe starting off as a, maybe as um, temporary which would be the what the 15 day one and then maybe the the second step one and doing a phase like you propose maybe for six months or so um i think those are all very good points um before you would allow them to be permanently for a year um i would just like to say as a as a business owner i think there's there's this these um certain businesses that could definitely benefit from this including myself um, unfortunately, right now, downtown doesn't have much of an option when it comes to food and anything like that, especially after like 9 o'clock. Um, I fall under that category where my customers come in and they're hungry and they're, they leave. They, they have to go out somewhere else and they spend their money somewhere else as opposed to leaving it here downtown. And um, I think for somebody like me, that right now there's not any options that there is in other towns, it would definitely benefit me. And... I think other 
businesses, maybe industrial zones and uh, in certain sections of the city. I think if we um, do this correctly, it could be very successful for everybody, the city and the business owners. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question. Okay, a couple questions, because unfortunately I'm the one who is always tasked with enforcing food trucks. Uh, so some questions I have regarding uh, locations. I'll just give an example. In Modesto, they're permitted in industrial areas and then other des specific designated areas like along the tracks. Um, however, we are constantly running into food trucks, parking in other locations along McHenry, that type of thing. Uh, so we're having to run them off on a regular basis. Uh, and that's something that I think Syria is going to have the same kind of problem with, um, including businesses that aren't even licensed. Fortunately, most of the ones that do sit up on McHenry have a license. They're just not permitted to be in that zone. Um, some other things. Um, Tom, so I know you did your research on this, but did you talk to environmental services? About food trucks specifically? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so when it comes to food trucks, they are supposed to prepare their food at another restaurant location or a commercial kitchen. I can't prepare it at home, the vehicle. So I just want you guys to think about that. Um, when you talk about another business supplementing, they're gonna have to have a location to cook that food. Um, just something to think about. Because uh, some of it's not prepared legally. Um, let's see. Okay, so for the, the TUP, I, I personally think a TUP is, is a great idea um, for, for special events and that type of thing. However, one thing I think that could be set up is, um, you know, you have a charitable, charitable solicitor's permit and when they get that permit that they're required to have, they have to say, okay, we're going to be selling Girl Scout cookies in front of Walmart from this date to this date, from this time to this time. So I don't see why the same thing couldn't happen with a TUP. They have to make that declaration to, to planning. Yeah, generally that would be part of the application process is they would give us the days, times, and location uh, of whatever event they were going to hold. Right, but that'll change throughout the year. It may or may not. Right, you know, they'll add it. Yeah. You know, they know a certain amount and then they'll get other ones. Correct. Um, so I don't see why something could be set up in place for that. And then once that information is acquired to pass that information on to code enforcement or the PD for dispatch so that they have that information in case they receive a call. Um, you guys pretty much already talked about it. I'd like to see if it is passed either for a CUP or an AUP. Uh, there's some kind of moratorium as far as the numbers um, that are permitted, especially initially, uh, because you're kind of opening up a door um, for a lot of problems if you get saturated with the, the food trucks. Um, oh, uh, one question is, so if you find someone that is operating out of compliance, say they do have a business license and one of the use permits, but they're not operating where they're supposed to be, the hours, that type of thing, they're out of compliance, what is the penalty? Um, one of the things I try to do as a standard practice with any temporary use permit, um, et cetera, is give myself the ability to ro revoke your permit. And so that'll be standard language in anything that's issued, whether it's a temporary use permit, administrative, or a conditional use permit. So if we find that somebody's not following the rules, they can just, approval can be terminated. Okay, now, could they also be cited at the time that they're in violation? Um, perhaps I think that the citation pales in comparison to the fact that you can't do business in town anymore, which would be the revocation. Okay. Um, I had one more, and I'm trying to find my note. Oh, regarding, I guess, I just need to clarify in my mind, for the, I guess, conditional use permit. So the way I understand it, you're talking about the stickers. Um, which is great, 
but so if it's for six months, but I think you were mentioning earlier that if they only use it like a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they still get the rest of that, those days. Would it be easier and as far as for enforcement purposes and record keeping in general to say, you know, from January through, through June, you get a red sticker and if you don't use it all, sorry. And then from July 1 through the end of the year, you get a blue sticker same thing as opposed to that way we don't have to count the days it's you get it's a six month period period end of story makes it easier for enforcement and tracking purposes just something to think about we hadn't got to that level uh, <laughs> to, to consider just yet yeah I, i'm thinking about it because i know it's going to be a nightmare for for some people but thank you anyone else okay all right, I'll bring it back to the council. Um, one thing um, that I'm hearing a lot of is that we're concerned with the proliferation of food trucks all, all around our city. Have we stopped to think about perhaps what we should do is we should say, instead of having the food truck um, come in and get a permit, permit, we have a business or a location come in for the permit, because if I'm thinking of something like Blaker where they don't want to have the same food truck every night, they want to have a rotation of them. Instead of having all of them come in, we only have the business come in, and then it is that specific location, and then whoever they're going to utilize also has to have um, the ability to get a permit, and then we know exactly where they're going to be, and it's not, and if they're, and so you have that on one side, and then you have the special event deal which, which is you know some type of a sanctioned thing that we have i mean it, it's just a thought um uh, and I, I think you might capture all that with what you have already it, I, I don't know if we did specifically but i can see your point if it's um, a location that maybe wants to do a friday saturday sunday but having a pizza brick oven one day versus a truck the next day um, I, I think that's probably something we could craft in there uh, to allow some flexibility, um, but still we're going to need to know who is going to be there because we need to verify that they have health department clearances and et cetera. So, um, yeah, what we would likely see both levels, right? So for the Blaker example or the Breasty Nail example, we would likely be the owner of the business being an AUP application and then we'd probably have an AUP application for those particular vendors as well. Um, and that perfect world is when they're working together, yep. right? And that's, but th there's obviously some details to work see, out. See, what you're, what you're gonna find in this, in this game is that there's a certain threshold that, that they need to make as far as the amount of money that they're going to do. So they're not, and unless they come to a consistent location where they can consistently get people to come to that location, they're not going to chase them all over everywhere. And so the, the business uh, model where people go like, for instance, E&J Gallo has every Thursday a different food truck comes for their employees. Well, that works for them because they have thousands of employees. It's not going to work for a food truck to go to where somebody's got 50 employees. They just don't sell enough meals. And when you talk to the ones that are in this business, if they don't make a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a day it's not worth their time or effort to go and do it because their costs are just aren't there so how do you limit that you say okay maybe g3 wants to have um uh, a truck there the the rusty nail wants to have a truck there blaker brewing that covers the the food trucks for the businesses that that want it then you have the special events where there's you know, let's just, and I'm just being hypothetical, I'm not saying this is, but let's say you had the smoke on the river or some big event like that where you want to say, okay, we want to allow food trucks for that. Then you, you kind of, we're kind of corralling that a little bit. And again, this is just me thinking out loud. Um, I, I agree with my colleagues. I don't want to see, you know, four food trucks uh, along, you know, the parks trying to solicit business. Now, mind you, I don't think there will be four of them along the park there because, again, it goes back to the law of supply and demand. And typically, these people don't want, if there's more than one or two at an event, unless the event's big enough, they don't want to be there because they're drawing away from each other's revenue stream. And there's just not enough there. So, and, and, and these are for the higher-end food trucks, obviously not the ones that might be what we think as the ones we wouldn't want. So... 
Um, so those are just a couple of comments. I mean, I can go with, with what you've presented. If we keep it in a six-month time frame, I don't think we're ever going to get it right, right out of the gate. I think we got to throw something against the wall, see how it works, and then adjust it uh, accordingly. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's my thinking. Uh, Councilmember Lane? You know, Mayor, I would agree. I think the business model is a good idea. I mean, we, got, we already know what's going on with, with um, Blaker. We already know they're being pretty successful, and they're, I think they're doing it three days a week, I think. Um, and I know that, you know, it makes sense because you're going to be able to control it and that sort of thing, something like that. I agree we don't want to see them, you know, I don't care to see them every thousand feet, honestly. And I don't know that, I don't know that we're really going to see them out there like that because, you know, if I was a, you know, business owner or owned a shopping center and I have, tenants renting from me out there I don't know that you know I want a building there whether it's a Wendy's or a, or one of the chicken places whatever is out there right all those different places I don't think you don't want a food vendor out there I mean as a as a uh, landowner but but even with that said I like to go I like the idea of <clears throat> what the mayor said about the business if we could add to that have the business owner apply for it and then have you know whoever's going to be out there they have to obviously have their permits in place too. I like that. You have really control over that. And I know, you know, now we're use, utilizing one now, obviously it's doing it. And I know probably Rusty now would like to be able to, to do that also. Um, and then the special events. I think that's a place to start. I don't know that I would want to go outside of that parameter right now. I think just starting there and seeing how that works out, honestly. Yeah, I think it's it would be pretty easy to craft that language to talk about kind of a business owner kind of establishing the location on their property or at their business or their site where these could come on a come on a, a, a pretty frequent basis. Um, staff will just have to craft something to to ensure that each of those trucks that shows up has the necessary approvals from the health department. I think that's something that can be done fairly easily. So um, I think you could probably have two levels through that same administrative use permit if there was a vendor who had a location who said I want to establish there for the 180 days they would have an option to go that that route if you had a business or a property owner who said well I want to just establish a location where I can have these things for up to 180 days then you could go the other route so you're providing the maximum amount of flexibility sure. vice mayor Klein well you know and I and I you know council member Lane was talking more of a temporary use permit but on an administrative use permit, one thing we really haven't discussed was not so much hours of operation, but how many hours of operation. I mean, we haven't discussed whether they open up at nine o'clock in one, one place and close at nine o'clock at night. You know, uh, is there any anything set or been discussed, uh, you know, within, the, within your department about, you know, limited the hours of operation? just has to be that they have to declare when they uh, request the permit what their hours of operation are going to be so if you have an individual that wants to open an open shop at 6 a.m. and they want to close at midnight we're gonna uh, we can say no okay yeah I, I don't know the demand for somebody to be there at 6 in the morning I mean may, maybe you're right maybe there is going to be that circumstance but we haven't limited the hours of operation just to say that they have to request it so um, because this is something that is going to be reviewed and approved by staff if we think that it's unreasonable we can say that they cannot have the hours that they've requested I mean because uh, purposefully you know anybody there that's probably there past midnight no good intentions there so well, if somebody was saying i want to be open until two in the morning that probably is going to generate um, something from staff that says no you won't and, and and i can understand those type of hours for special events you know blaker brewing something at river oaks or something like that but i was looking more at when we look at the you know administrative use permit in the industrial zone you know where you know a lot of those businesses are shut down at you know nine o'clock at night so okay council moreno i think to just even begin 
having the mobile food vendors, I would like to forget about the administrative use permit and just focus on a conditional use permit and a TUP for the special events. The CUP would allow places like Blaker, the Rusty Nail, businesses that we already have in town that can't provide food, but it would allow them the opportunity to even see how it works. And then the TUP for someone like River Oaks that wants to have something in conjunction with an event. But I don't think that we need to do all three right at the beginning. I think the other two should be able to handle what I, I think it would just give us an idea to see how things are going and it shouldn't be for a year. I think the mayor made a comment about, someone did, about six months and let's see what happens in six months. So is that your motion? That's my motion. Second. Well, okay. Real quickly, we didn't schedule this as an action item, so oh, this, is, this okay. is a discussion item. Um, in order for right. us to create a pilot program, we need to, uh, this would need to run back through the Planning Commission and City Council for action for us to put something like this in place. So we'll need to work with legal to get the framework in place. And so we we're looking for direction. We didn't want to go create a program without council buy-in for the direction that we're headed. So that was the motion to give you direction. There you go. And that, that's, we got what we needed. Be quiet now. And for Councilman and Rhino, uh, okay. for your thought about the conditional use permit, Councilman Rhino. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, for your thought about the conditional use permit, you would be open to industrial and commercial zoning designations? I don't even want to talk about it administrative right now. No, I no, no, no just for the conditional use, use permit. Oh. Yeah, conditional yeah. use, are you going to limit it? Are you a husband? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's like I'm not even listening so to you. So the I'm conditional sorry. use... <laughs> You had had a, oh. you had a, you had had a comment that maybe maybe just an industrial area is to start, but the framework. Oh no no written. no no! I don't think I said that. I I don't remember saying yeah. industrial. It could be anywhere. There so they could be in commercial or industrial locations. Say the CUP, well, yes. With the CUP. With the CUP, my thought was it would be in in conjunction with or supplement an existing business, and I was thinking more in terms of places like the rusty nail or blaker brewing someone that has a business but they don't have the ability to provide food but they have customers who would like to eat so then not necessarily having a food truck disconnected to somebody that doesn't have a business that would just be food trucks in association with an existing business yes yes okay okay i think you've got the direction you need Okay, great. So at this time, uh, council member referrals, is there anyone on the council that would like to have an item placed on a future agenda? Okay, hearing none reports. Um, I have nothing to report. Council member Rhino? Well, I think I may be uh, Mr. Jordan and the city manager, but this Friday at 930, we will have the official opening of the dog park over on Booth and Ballard. That's it. Okay. Vice Mayor Klein? Nothing. Councilman Merlane? Uh, this weekend, oops. This last weekend, the uh, Centennial down at the Whitmore Mansion, I thought it turned out pretty successful, and you're absolutely right, it was awful hot, but um, out, on the, out in the shade and sitting around the, on tables out there that we had on the line, it wasn't that bad. But anyway, I think it was successful, and thank you guys for uh, putting all that effort into that and making it happen too. So good job. Councilman Madrasa? Nothing. Okay, Ms. Dean? Nothing. Mr. Hallahan? Nothing, Mayor. Mr. Wells? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a reference to the Measure L Citizens Oversight Committee. We have a vacancy on that committee still. Um, we're going to put some information out trying to find a citizen to uh, volunteer uh, as part of the Stancog effort of overviewing our Measure L expenditures. Um, so we still have an opening on that if you're interested. We have some information on our website and we'll be putting some additional information out. So if you know of anybody who's interested, uh, we're looking for a volunteer. 
Uh, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock, Measure H meeting, uh, will be meeting, the quarterly meeting for Measure H. Um, as was referenced, the Centennial Committee uh, continues to work. Um, kind of the next step in the process is uh, getting um, sponsorships for the bricks. So for those of you who aren't aware, we're building a monument um, to the Centennial right out here on the corner, right on the corner of um, Magnolia and 4th Street. Uh, in that monument, you have the opportunity to purchase bricks, those um, monument uh, Brick forms are now available. We'll be putting those on our website, looking for uh, folks to do that. Cutoff date will be October 15th. We hope to start construction um, around the Halloween festival uh, with a completion by the um, Christmas festival. So that would wrap up our centennial celebration with the completion of that project. So look forward to that and the opportunity to purchase bricks uh, for that project. And that's it. Okay, uh, Mr. Westbrook. The Whitmore Ranch Specific Plan Environmental Impact Report, the review and comment period today for the EIR closed, so we'll be getting the comments to our consultant uh, so that they can be responded to. Once that happens, we'll be setting up public hearings for the Planning Commission and City Council to consider that project. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes, I want to um, take just a second to compliment the detectives this weekend. Um, they uh, did a pretty good investigation where they wrote a search warrant, recovered well over $100,000 worth of stolen um, stuff, brand new still in the boxes from Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, and so forth. So they're in the process right now of trying to get rid of it, get it back to their rightful owners. We have everything in the back just loaded. Wow. Okay. Mr. Collins? Uh, Ms. McCoy's gone. Rich? I think. I think. Jeremy? Nope. Okay. At uh, this time, we will move to closed session where we have conference with labor negotiator. After that, um, if there's anything to report, we will. If not, then we will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which will be Monday, August 27. Thank you.